Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our next press conference of EGU 23, the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. I'm Gillian D'Souza. I'm EGU's Media and Communications Officer, and I will be hosting um, the press conference today, as well as any media interactions and interviews you would like to do um, following this uh, press briefing. Um, today, I would like to introduce our speakers in a few minutes. But just before we get into the press briefing, I have to announce that unfortunately, our third speaker, due to unforeseen circumstances, was unable to join us today. So we will only be hearing from two of our speakers today. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, each press conference will have time for the speakers to make their presentation. And then we will follow this with a short question and answer round towards the end. And if you're joining us virtually, I ask that you mute your microphones up until the end of the press conference. And if you have questions at the end, then we will come to you and take them in the chat or uh, through the hand raising function on Zoom. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers so that we can have faster transitions between them. This press conference is titled From Vikings to Vienna to the Venice of the Pacific, Geoarchaeology Elucidates History. And we are joined by two speakers in the room. So on my, from the left, we will be meeting Diana Hatzenbühler from the University of Vienna, Department of Geology, Vienna, Austria. And then we have Chuan Cho River Shen from High Precision Mass Spectrometry and Environment Change Laboratory, National Taiwan University, Taiwan. So welcome, thank you once again for joining us and for um, being here to share your findings with us. We are ready to begin and we will first hear from Chuan Cho. Thank you for your uh, introduction. Uh, here I'm going to present our uh, study. Uh, the title of our study is Dating a Reward Unique Pacific Ruins uh, called Lamando. Uh, look at the background. Background is uh, the over 100 artificial islets in the Pacific. Uh, so it basically is a, like a floating city. So it's a nickname is a Venus of the Pacific. Uh, my name is Chuan uh, Zhou Xian. You can tell the second character, Chuan. Chuan Chuan's like a river, right? So call, few people call me river. Chuan Zhou is difficult, yes. And uh, so you can tell uh, this is uh, our, our site. And this is Vienna. So Quite similar, right? But but when this protein city constructed, uh, actually the exact duration nobody knows. Uh, over the past two hundred years. So here, uh, we went to the field, collected samples, coral samples, uh, and they determine the ages, and we find the history and uh, the onset and downfall of the Southern Dynasty, the kingdom called Southern Dynasty. Uh, this one, again, uh, in the past over 200 years study, uh, people believe uh, this one, uh, based on the uh, oral history, not in writing system developed. So just uh, uh, the, the history has a generation to generations, and you couldn't tell which one is true, which one is wrong, which one is fake. So, uh, but basically, uh, now we know uh, the kingdom called Southern uh, began around the uh, 1100 to 1300 AD. And then the downfall of the Southern and then the seas of the, the, this broad, broad city uh, around the 1500 to 1600 AD. But after our work, we find actually the ages could be the, the rise of the kingdom could be earlier than uh, middle 11th uh, century and the uh, downfall collapse of the southern the kingdom and uh, the, the, the construction seas uh, is in the early 15th century. Yeah, it's our results. And you can tell this, this side, this side is our uh, constructed model of the Lamando uh, uh, about 1000 years ago, yeah. And here, where is uh, Lamando? Uh, this is located in a, on a, 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 a island called Ponape in uh, Micronesia in Pacific Ocean. 
uh, uh, you can tell the B, B you can see the Lamando La located in the uh, southeast side of this uh, Panape. And uh, the left upper side uh, is a uh, bird view of uh, this floating city. Yes, and the D, D is uh, uh, the complete constructions the consists uh, consists over 100 uh, islets. Uh, e is that this this compound, the, this entire site uh, is constructed with uh, colonial basalt and uh, infield, uh, coral rubber fields inside. Yes, and this site uh, has been selected as a, a world heritage uh, in 2016, but the history not really known yet. And here I'm going to show you a movie about uh, this site. Canada is among the largest human source stone complexes in the Pacific. Consists of over 100 artificial islands and serves as the capital of the ancient Saudi dynasty. Namigal is located off the southeast coast of Canada in the eastern north of Asia. The site complex is less than 0 0.7 kilometers by 1.5 kilometers. This is a conceptual rendering of the reconstructed Namigal. Namigal is constructed with some 300,000 cubic meters of stone building materials with a total mass of 0 0.5 to 0 0.75 million metric tons of basalt and total rubber field. Yeah, this one is uh, I and uh, our collaborator uh, was creating uh, coral rubber fields uh, in the field. So, um, uh, the earliest uh, Western context in the uh, was in the 1820s, and then people are curious about how this constructed this site. So they began uh, uh, they began doing the research over the past 200 years, uh, even uh, do the excavations, and then uh, charcoal 14 datings. Uh, these charcoals are collected from the uh, layers of the artifacts. So this indicates the human uh, activity over on the left side. And this one here uh, is a, a coral, uh, not coral, charcoal C14 ages distribution. So uh, summarize is, is the, the one. This site could be uh, constructed from uh, 500 to 600 AD. And then this, this site became the capital of the kingdom south around 1100 to 1300 AD and the collapse of the kingdom and then and, and, and the, the, uh, the construction ceased around the 1500 to 1600 AD. Uh, yes, and this is about the uh, best estimates, estimates in the past uh, 200 years. Uh, after the 200 year study. But there's a, a local belief suggests that actually age of Lamando will always return and uh, remain hidden, never, never to be revealed. And we believe this one because this is a very difficult uh, topic. It's a good topic for us. And so we went there uh, two times. One is uh, a two, uh, 2016 and another one in 2018. Uh, we, we got a permit and then collected uh, over 152 corals from the different uh, islets, including the, the one from the, uh, from the uh, King's Palace and some from the, this one's the tomb complex and other uh, uh, like a typical uh, islets and also the sea walls here. And, and then we collect them, uh, determine the ages with uh, uranium thorium radiometric dating technique. The best age we can guess is, uh, is uh, plus minus uh, two years, two sigma. Uh, and, and here is the result. And uh, we find uh, from the zero AD is a uh, homo sapien arrived at this island. So we find a uh, local uh, oral history said uh, the, the people went to the coast, the beach, collected living coral to build, build the, the structure compounds. But actually, 
uh, the, the data here only 112 ages. The main 40 ages is fossils. It's uh, older than zero, uh, 1 AD, see here. Uh, uh, some, some ages around the like uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, even 7,000 years old. This is fossil. So uh, the, the local history said only in different coral use is not completely correct. Okay, and then the, the corals distribution here uh, after the, uh, the Homo sapiens arrived is that, that, that. And you can tell from the, the, from the there's a peak around the, uh, 1055 to 1075 AD, there's a peak. It's an important indication because of the peak total we stated the nine corals. Nine corals, all nine corals, eight corals from the, this uh, tomb complex. The one from the king's palace. So this implication is that this kingdom put, put uh, Right, right, about uh, before this one, and we estimated uh, could be around the 10 to 11th century, around 10, uh, 10 to 11th century. And, and then based on this distribution, you can tell look here, 14, 11, no any corals here, abruptly gone, disappear. Uh, so this is a, a collapse of the kingdom. Uh, by people, yes, by people. So here's a, a conclusion again. Um, in the past, people, uh, uh, in the past, people believe this one, uh, this uh, Venus of the Pacific constructed, uh, the intense constructed from the uh, 11 to 1300 AD, actually not, not, not quite true. Uh, could before uh, uh, middle 11th century or 10th century. And downfall of the kingdom Southern and Lamando construction ceased uh, around 1500 or 1600s, uh, probably not correct, uh, could be uh, right after uh, 1411. Yes, so our findings uh, it's, uh, uh, earlier about the couple century earlier than previous those. This is our uh, study because uh, uh, this one's still under our review yet. So, so uh, I did not discuss about the, the collapse, the onset and, and the downfall of the kingdom and the construction history to related to the tectonic uh, and also the climate change. Uh, this part I did not uh, did I mention here. Yeah, and the uh, US I will briefly introduce this part. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and next we will hear from Diana Hatzenbühler. Um, so my name is Diana Hatzenbühler and I'm a PhD student from the University of Vienna. And in our working group, which is also uh, together with Michael Weisel, who is here, uh, we are working on the um, time from Romans to Anthropocene, especially putting a certain focus on Vienna and the area downstream of it. Today, I will take you on a little time travel back in time. We will stay here in Vienna, but we go back to its origin in the Roman time. And I will show you how it could develop to the city, to the cultural city we now know as Vienna. And for this, we will go to the central Vienna basin. What you can see here in the upper right corner, we have a map of Austria. We are currently in the Northeast in Vienna. On the left-hand side, you can maybe also spot the EGU symbol, which uh, shows you where we, who is currently here, where we are currently sitting. And this map, mm, uh, this map is a topographic map. It shows you the elevation of the underground above sea level. The more reddish the colors, the higher elevated. Uh, for example, in the eastern side, we have some mountainous area, and the more bluish, the lower elevated. In the middle, you can see a unicolored area, which is bluish, greenish, and this is the central Vienna basin where our story now takes place. 
Um, what you can also see that to the bottom of it, to the south, we have a slightly elevated area. Um, and along this margin, the Danube River flows, who is our main actor here. The Danube River flows from the west to the east. And um, let me tell you, it is a very dynamic and wild river. Um, even though it looks like here, it's just a straight line going from the left to the right. It's a um, very meandering river who's changing this course quite often, frequently. And this was exactly the case also in Roman times. And um, this was also the reason why the Romans, who had their empire in the south, why they founded these two cities or these two former settlements, Canuntum and Vindobona. Vindobona will later become Vienna. And the reason for doing this, well, um, you can see it here in this picture. On the picture, you see um, uh, soldiers and horses, which are crossing the Danube River on ship bridges. And this was, um, this is from a column around the second century CE. Just to let you know, CE is, um, let's say the more modern way to say it to refer to our um, calendaric time point. But not just the Romans, they saw the value of these two locations. But also, for example, Napoleon, as you can see in this painting here, he used the positions to cross the Danube River, maybe in an even more elaborate way. But let's come back to, um, to our settlements. I will now show you a model how these two settlements might have looked like back then. Here we have Vindobona and Canuntum, and they were founded around the same time. They are not too far away from each other. They have similar starting conditions, with Canuntum being slightly more important. However, their development over time was completely different. Vienna became the vibrant metropolis we now know. Vindobona became now Vienna, while Canuntum has ceased to exist and can be only seen in remnants uh, in archaeological sites, even though they're quite pretty. And what uh, we will go now through is why? How did, could it come, um, come to this? And for this, we have to go back again to the Vienna Basin and look at the geopolitical setting. So Canuntum was the province capital of this area here. You can see it by the little helmet. However, this had also certain consequences for the location. For example, it was more prone to riots. Being a rather large uh, settlement, it was also more in the focus for uh, military uh, invasions and attacks. So the situation here was a bit tricky. Also, it was more exposed. Um, uh, for example, to the east, there were no more, or there weren't any close Roman settlements who could come to help in case of some uh, intruders. The situation in Vindobona was slightly different. Um, we had less potential for invasions, for riots, it was less exposed, so they could just continue living their happy Roman life. And another point which is likely to be an important factor here is the water. I mean, maybe you can already see it here. Water is quite an important thing here in Vienna with the Danube River. And we had also more access to water here, the, uh, for, um, for example, from the hinterland. And for the Romans, water supply was essential. Just think of the Roman baths, for example, but also the industry and for, the, um, to, for a city to prosper, it was essential. And this was not the case in Canuntum. It was more difficult. And this can be also one of the many reasons which had um, as a consequence that the province capital position and other privileges were switched to Vendobona. And Canuntum has ceased to exist over time because it couldn't recover from all the attacks it experienced. And by the 15th century, Canuntum was no more. Vendobona survived and it continued to be a little settlement also until the 10th century when we had a new ruler here. And this new ruler, he invested into fortification. And in, in case you're in Vienna, you can still see some remnants of the city walls and they have become a crucial factor, again, um, to help the, the city to survive. Because later, for example, in the 15th century, we had um, attacks from the Ottoman Empire, later on also by the Hungarian, but Vendobona could still survive. However, what has been a um, survival factor has, uh, has shown to be the rather limiting factor for the city. So in the 19th century, there were some more construction sites going on. Exposure was not more important, but the fortification, they were just restricting the city and uh, preventing it to further flourish and had also some other consequences. 
So uh, a natural, uh, more or less natural um, result was the removal of the fortification and um, certain other constructions. For example, also the river regulations to get control over this dynamic river and to, to also control its course. This was also later followed by dam regulation, which further influenced the, this river in some way or another. Um, now we arrive at the second half of the uh, 20th century, when Dobona has now become the metropolis Vienna, or is at least on the way to it. And this is exactly the time when we had the great acceleration. Everything is becoming faster and faster. We have more, uh, we have more living room com being constructed, more industrial sites, but also more impact in the environment and the city is just growing and growing. And this is also, uh, the, this coincides with the pro proposed starting point of the Anthropocene, which is um, a discussed time unit, um, which basically says that the human fingerprint has arrived in geology. We geologists, we basically look at rocks and sand, and so far human fingerprint was not too important here, but this is not the case anymore. And I can show you, uh, and this can be already seen in this area here. For example, this picture is from, um, is an outcrop close, not too far away from what used to be Canuntum. And what you can see here, a sudden change in the upper uh, one meter where we can see clear human impact in form of a pot and form of plastic. But this is also seen on a larger scale for example, again, here in the area of Heimburg, which is close to where Kanuntum used to be, where entire mountains, they are just shoveled away. And again, coming back to the Great Acceleration, uh, for geologists, this would take many thousands, millions of years to just get close to removing an entire mountain. But we humans, we are way faster at this. And this is also what we want to do. We want to understand how fast are we, how far do we go and can we also use it to see how the future of Vienna might look like. Thank you very much. We are ready to move on to the next part of our press conference today, which is the question and answer round. So if we have any questions now, I open the floor to journalists, both present in the room and those joining us online. Uh, please raise your hand if you have some questions for our speakers and I will come to you with the microphone. And um, if you do have questions and introduce yourself and feel free to um, ask your question. We just give it another minute maybe um, if anyone would like to ask something. All right, so it doesn't look like we have questions today. Um, clearly our speakers explained all of their findings rather too well. So thank you so much again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, we are now ready to conclude this press conference. The recording of the entire press briefing will be uploaded to EGU's official YouTube channel uh, later today or first thing tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Um, I would also like to remind you that we have our last press conference of EGU 23 scheduled for later today at 2 p.m., the title of which is Wars Impact Oceans, Sands, and People. So I look forward to seeing some of you there and um, have a rest, uh, have a good rest of the EGU 23 week. Thank you all.